Howdy ho, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we watch more of ESPN commentator Sarah Spain chastise Christians for holding Christian views and discuss the line where heterodoxy becomes heresy. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your heretic today as we appropriate some culture. So last week we looked at the blowback that five players from the Tampa Bay Rays received after opting out of wearing a pride symbol on their uniforms for Pride Night. One of the blowhards dishing out the blowback was Sarah Spain who said this. Pride is about inclusion, so you don't love them and you don't welcome them if you're not willing to wear the patch. And calling it a lifestyle reveals to me that you've done not even a modicum of research or understanding on this topic. It's what tends to happen when a privileged class isn't affected by things. This is not just about baseball. That religious exemption BS, which is used in sport and otherwise, also allows for people to be denied health care, jobs, apartments, children, prescriptions, all sorts of rights. And so we have to stop tiptoeing around it because we're trying to protect people who are trying to be bigoted from asking for them to be exempt from it when the very people that they are bigoted against are suffering the consequences. When you say trying to be bigoted. They're trying to use religious exemptions to affect the opportunities, services, uh, uh, available resources for people who are LGBTQ+. And a patch on the jersey in, in this way? In the case of sport, no. In the case of sport, though, they're double talking if they're saying you're welcome while also saying that we don't encourage or, or we disagree with it, especially when there are devout people of every single religion that also welcome and are open to people who are born gay. They now, I addressed most of that in the previous episode. If you missed that, you can go back and watch. But what I want to focus on today is the tail end of that segment. Because if there's going to be Christian persecution in this country, I think it's likely to come through this line of reasoning. It goes like this. There are people who profess to be Christians who have no issue with practicing homosexuality. Therefore, Christianity isn't the issue. The religion isn't the issue. You're the issue. Why can't you be a good Christian like those other Christians who are welcoming and accepting of all the colors of the rainbow flag? It's not your religion. Don't give me that BS. Those are guys are in your religion. It's just because you're a bigot. And we don't take kindly to bigots around here. Now, of course, you could point to the scriptures and highlight all the various verses that condemn homosexuality, and we did some of that last episode, but as soon as there's dissenting voices, even if they're in the minority, the authoritative nature of scripture becomes reduced to merely an interpretation. And the fact of the matter is, we do have different interpretations and different schools of thought under the umbrella of Christianity on a whole host of topics. Complementarianism, egalitarianism, Calvinism, Arminianism, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. And let's face it, as a Protestant, my commonly held beliefs were at one time heterodoxy. And for centuries, Protestant and Catholics killed each other, decrying that the other was a heretic. And yet now, we still have strong disagreements, but both sides generally agree it's not a salvation issue. And both Protestants and Catholics recognize and accept each other as Christians. But at some point, there is a theological demarcation. And if you cross that line, you are no longer Christian. Mormons would fall under that category. Neither Protestants nor Catholics regard Mormons as Christian. There are core teachings and essential doctrines that define Christianity. But the question then is, how do we determine what is or isn't essential doctrine to Christianity? How do we suss out what is essential and what is secondary? Well, our credo statements might help as being indicative of the core teachings and beliefs of Christianity. Here's the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Short, 
pithy, easy to memorize, which might have been the point. The Nicene Creed is a little more expansive, and because it was dealing with Arianism, it's much more focused on the nature of Jesus and the Trinity. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. Not bad. And if you hold to those statements, it's a fair bet that you're a Christian. But you'll notice none of those creeds mentioned homosexuality. And more to the point, they don't mention the inerrancy of Scripture. They don't list what books are Scripture and which aren't. We don't get the official canonization of the New Testament until the 4th century. Catholics and Protestants disagree about the deuterocanonical books, the, the Apocrypha as we call it. They accept some books and we don't. It's Old Testament, but still. Martin Luther wanted to toss the book of James. Is the authority of Scripture essential to Christianity? If we toss out books like 1st and 2nd Maccabees, why can't they toss out verses? As long as they're still adhering to the basic tenets of Christianity as outlined by our creeds. You have professing Christians who are practicing homosexuals who absolutely would agree with every single line of the creeds we just read. You know, people like Guy Benson or Spencer Clavin. And honestly, I haven't seen anything in their words or deeds that suggests to me that they don't sincerely believe in the doctrines outlined in the creeds. And the Bible says this, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So is this homosexual issue simply, like others, an issue of interpretation regarding non-essential doctrine of Christianity? I don't think so. Now, I'm not saying that Guy Benson or Spencer Clavin are going to burn in hell. I don't make any judgments on that. God is going to sort it out and he's going to be right. And on a personal level, I very much like both of them and appreciate some of Spencer Clavin's scriptural analysis. But the authority of scripture is essential to Christianity because the scripture is how we define Christianity. You can point to creeds, but the creeds don't have authority in and of themselves. They're authoritative because they're a synthesis of scripture. The creedal statements are formed by and derived from the Bible. That's the source. There's an important line in the Nicene Creed which says, according to the scriptures. The scriptures are the foundation for all these creedal statements. And that was the view from church leaders. Or as one bishop writing in the early 400s put it, the words of the creed are few, but all the mysteries are in them. Selected from the whole of Scripture and put together for the sake of brevity, they are like precious gems making a single crown. Thus, all the faithful have sufficient knowledge of salvation, even though many are unable or too busy with their worldly affairs to read the Scriptures. And so, beloved, whether you are walking, resting, or at work, whether you are asleep or awake, let this salutary confession be ever in your hearts. Let your soul be ever in heaven." The authority of Scripture is essential. You don't have the creedal statements apart from it. The Scriptures are how we define Christianity. Now, there are disagreements on interpretation, on what certain things mean. But the important thing to see is that all valid interpretations make a positive case from Scripture to support their view. So, for instance, I don't hold to transubstantiation, the idea that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. I don't agree with that. But they can point to scripture to support their view. John 6, 55, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Okay, but on the other hand, you can point to something like Luke twenty two twenty. 20. 
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Nobody thinks that the cup is literally the new covenant. It's representative of the new covenant. So in that passage, we see that when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, the elements are symbolic, not literal. Okay, well, we can have that discussion. It's valid interpretation and debate because all signs have a positive case from Scripture. But that is not the case when it comes to homosexuality. There is no positive example of homosexuality in Scripture anywhere at all. It doesn't exist. The Bible says one thing about homosexuality, and it says it repeatedly. It says it in the Old Testament. It says it in the New Testament. Prescriptively, it tells us not to engage in it. Descriptively, every single example is not positive. And you'll notice that the proponents on the other side don't actually put forth a positive case to support their position. They simply deny the plain reading of the text. They'll go, well, you know, if you look at the Greek and, and think about it in cultural terms, what that means is uh, temple prostitution. It's talking about idolatry. Or, or it's really talking about rape. Or it's pedophilia or premarital sex. It's funny because with all the other sexual sins, the plain reading of the text works just fine. You don't need to be a Greek scholar or a historian when it comes to adultery or premarital sex or rape, prostitution, bestiality, polygamy even. Just this one. This sexual sin is special for some reason, which we're not going to explain. And the perniciousness of this is once you allow yourself to deny one aspect of Scripture, where's the limiting principle? If they're not putting forth a positive case from Scripture, they're just denying, and anybody can just deny what words mean, adultery. You know, uh, the Bible writers just didn't have a modern concept of an open marriage. And when it speaks against adultery, uh, the real issue there is a lack of consent, you know, one party not consenting. And yeah, the Bible says that elders and deacons should only have one wife, but uh, I'm not marrying the other partners. And besides, we're all one in Christ. And with the early church, it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Frankly, I just made a better argument for open marriage than anything I've heard in regards to homosexuality, which isn't saying much. And this is essential to Christianity because if you disregard scripture when it comes to statements on human sexuality, then why do you believe anything else? Because it's only according to the scriptures that I believe homosexual behavior is sin, but it's also only according to the scriptures that I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, or believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, it's only according to the scriptures that I believe the third day he rose again from the dead and ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. It's only according to the scriptures that I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Denying scripture is not interpreting scripture. And when you wantonly deny scripture, the whole thing comes undone because there is no limiting principle there. The authority of scripture is essential to Christianity because without it, there is no Christian doctrine and nothing for Christians to adhere to or identify as. Well, that'll do for today. As always, you can like, subscribe, rate, and review. Join my author's Facebook page, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriating the Culture.